I am excited to introduce introduce Susan Magzamen. She is the founder and director of the International Arts and Mind Lab Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she is a faculty member. She is also the co-director of the NeuroArts Blueprint. Susan works with both the public and private sectors using arts and cultural evidence-based approaches in areas including health, child development, education, workforce innovation, rehabilitation, and social equity. Welcome, Susan. We're so glad you're with us today. Really a pleasure to be here. Excuse me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be in conversation with everyone here. So first, um, Susan is here. She It was brought to my attention that she had written a book called Your Brain on Art, which was an incredible read because I have to read everything. <laughs> and so my first question to you, this is going to be kind of informal today. We're going to have kind of a chat. Um, somebody even said that it was one of the her favorite books that she read this year. And so just enjoying it. What prompted you to write this book? So, you know, it, I guess it was a couple of things that really brought me to, to writing the book. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you two. One is around the barn and the other is a little shorter. Um, the round the barn answer is that from the time I was a little girl, I really knew that the power of the arts to help us heal and thrive um, was so important and that it was really beyond um, the way that we could heal was beyond language and beyond words. And that was because um, I'm a twin. And um, when my I was 12 years old, my sister had a farming accident and she almost lost her leg. And if you any of you are twins or have twins or no twins, um, you know that twins are almost telepathic. Um, we feel each other. Um, and like if I had a tummy ache, uh, my sister was having her appendix out. You know, if uh, we could literally feel each other um, feelings. But when she had this accident, I couldn't feel her and she couldn't share what was happening with her. And um, I come from a family of makers. Um, my mom's a poet, uh, amateur poet. Um, my grandmothers uh, both were knitters and quilters. And um, my mom made all of our clothes. Like we, we were makers, cooking, you know, you, anything that our daily lives were making. And so my mother said to my sister, why don't you start drawing? You know, drawing might be something for you. Um, my grandmother used to say, idle hands are the work of the devil. <laughs> and so my sister started to draw. And when she shared this work with me, I could feel what she couldn't speak. And now we know that the BRCA region of the brain shuts down during a trauma. And so for my, my sister, she couldn't share it because there were no words. And she ultimately, interestingly, wrote a book called When There Are No Words, um, many, many years, like 30 years later. But what I was able to see in these images through color and metaphor and symbol was the fear and the loss and the pain and the shock of all of this. And so we were able to begin to understand that there were many ways of, of voice. Um, so then cut to um, my, oh, my my life's work has been working with the arts in health and well-being and learning in all different forms. And I hope we'll talk some of that. But um, at Hopkins, I developed a model called impact thinking on how to study the arts. And, you know, it's only been the last 20 years that studying the arts from a neurobiological perspective has been possible because um, we couldn't get inside our heads non-invasively. So we knew some things from neurosurgeons, but we really we really had a more philosophical um, humanities understanding of and psychological behavioral understanding of the arts, but we didn't have any neurobiology or cognitive science. And so um, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, um, I was asked to meet with the Aspen Institute to talk about how do you build this field of neuroaesthetics? Now that we know more about what's happening in the brain, how do you build this field? And I was invited Ivy Ross, who is my co-author, to um, to join in um, something called the Luminary Scholars, which are really accomplished people at the lab that are doing amazing things in the world. So like the architects, musicians, writers, the guy that wrote Dear Evan Hansen and La La Land is one of our luminary scholars. Um, uh, but we 
these are people that and Ivy had been a, a jewelry designer, a clothing designer. She ran Mattel um, girls division. Um, so she really was a prolific designer and communicator building design teams. So I wrote her and I said, you know, I'm working in this area. I'd love to talk to you. And what started as a 30 minute call ended up three hours later, each of us kind of canceling our next half an hour meetings. Um, and we were just enthralled with each other's work. So she had a she had a salon at her home a couple months later where I was beginning to put the foundation together around the neuro arts blueprint. Like how would we build this field? What would that mean? What would, what are the researchers role, the practitioners role, policymakers, um, you know, how does funding, you know, how do you build a field like women's health or, or bioethics or anything? How do, how do you build a field? So we pulled these people together. Ivy called it the Noah's Ark of neuro arts because there was two dancers, two photographers, two neuroscientists, two cognitive scientists, two philanthropists. And, and we asked this, this very simple question, which is, have the arts ever impacted your life in some way? And again, hours later, people were sharing these incredible stories about how the arts had changed their lives. So when we were cleaning up, I said to Ivy, you know, this is going to take a decade to build a field. You know, it's not going to happen fast, um, but we have enough science and enough information to say that we know that the arts are accessible and immediate and for the most part affordable. If you think about them the way we do, um, I'd like to write a general public book for this because I think we need to get this information out now. And I said, would you want to do it with me? And she said, this is the book I've been waiting for. And so it was really took us four years to write it during COVID. It, we interviewed over 120 scientists and practitioners and people with lived experience to really be able to coalesce and, and tell these stories about the ways that the arts change us in physical health and mental health and well-being and learning. So it's really been, I say it's a love letter um, that has really been um sort of an extraordinary gift to be able to, to work on. The introduction, it says that you're the founder and co-director of the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics. So what exactly is neuroaesthetics? Because you hear it and it just sounds like, you know, like, is your brain pretty? <laughs> Obviously, that's yeah. not what this is. It's a big word. I would say it's a quarter word. You know, it's like it's a very big word. Um, so neuroaesthetics, the definition of neuroaesthetics is the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change your brain, body and behavior. That's the first half. And then the second half is um, and how this knowledge can be applied, be translated into health, well-being, learning, community engagement um, to really address some of the really intractable problems of our time. And so um, the lab was built, um, we initially were launched in around 2007. And the reason, you know, you might think, how could a school of medicine be um, doing something with the arts? That doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, we had a very um, visionary donor who wanted to give money, a large amount of money to the School of Medicine. But and she wanted to understand how the brain worked. But what she really wanted to understand was how the arts change our brains. Um, and she really believed that the arts could save humanity, that 100%. And so she allowed the bandwidth, the blank canvas, if you will, for us to be able to start to really think about how would you study this work? Because remember, it was very, very new field. And what we knew about at that time were some things around sensory systems. Um, we In 2000, maybe four years before we really launched the lab, there was a scientist still alive, his name is Samir Zeki at University College London. And he was interested in the neurobiological correlates of beauty. And so he was very interested in, you know, how does beauty show up in the brain? So he used fMRI and uh, what he did was show people different pieces of art, physical art, um, visual art. And what he was able to see is that in the front of the brain, in the prefrontal cortex, the same part of the brain lit up 
when someone was looking at something that they perceived as beautiful. And it was the first time that anybody had seen the neurological center of where beauty registers in the brain. But was super interested. That was, you know, you could stop there. But what was really interesting was that what he saw was that not everybody saw the same things as beautiful. Um, and so beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. And we now know that um, we perceive what is beautiful based on where we come from, what we know, our genetics, our lived experiences. And so for, for art, for things, and I define art as creative expression. So it's the things we make. Um, and that could be many, many kinds of things. It could be the food you make. It could be the clothes you make. It could be the way you put a bouquet of flowers together, or it could be dance, visual arts, performing arts, creative writing. Um, but we perceive those things differently based on those lived experiences that we have. So um, I think it helps us understand that we don't all see the world in the same way because of and or, or value things in a similar way from an art perspective. But what's also interesting is that when there are two things that we pretty much humanity agrees on, one is natural landscapes. We all agree in landscapes, what's beautiful and not beautiful. And, and I think that has to do with our evolutionary biology. And we also agree on faces, what faces are beautiful and not. And we, we particularly are very interested in this sort of um, triangle and around smiles. Um, and that makes sense too, because we survive based on understanding emotional valence from faces. Faces are so um, uh, characteristic of showing for the most part, you know, most of us don't have poker faces. Most of us share our expressions. And if we don't share expressions in our faces, we embody cognition. So if we're sad, usually we're down, we're looking down. If we're in awe, we're usually looking up, if we're inspired. And so our physiology is something that we all sort of share across all cultures. mentioned your lab your center in your lab can you tell us a little bit more about the work in your lab like what do you do sure so i shared earlier that uh, a couple years in we realized that it was really uh, there really wasn't a scientific method to study the arts there are there is the scientific method for um, neuroscience um, or biology where you know it's a reductionist model where you want to understand the smallest thing and then you want to understand the next smallest thing but it's it's really considered a reductionist model and it's it's objective not subjective um, but the arts are a generative model and they're you have to allow for subjectivity. So we've pulled together um, around 30 different types of researchers and said, you know, is there a need for a scientific method in the arts, studying the arts and aesthetics? And overwhelmingly, the agreement was, yes, there is. And so working over a couple of years, we put together this impact thinking model, which is a nine step model on how to study the arts. And it comes out of a what I think of as solution science. So we start with what problem we're solving for. So a good example would be what might um, what might um, what might be helpful for people with Parkinson's to have better gait. Um, and then we do a very broad literature review in all different forms and fields to try to understand: is there any signal there? Is there any um, knowledge that we can glean? And we try to come up with a hypothesis based on that literature and it can be quite broad and I think that's part of its strength and then we try to put together a way to test that and that can be both qualitative and quantitative we go through what would be maybe considered a more rigorous process of trying using an art or aesthetic experience what might be helping to address that kind of an issue um, and so that's that's sort of the beginning couple of five six steps but then once we know what's working we're very focused on dissemination and scaling and evaluation. And that's because um, in, in medicine, it usually takes between 12 and 15 years for an, a discovery to come to market, for it to reach FDA approval, for it to get the kind of support that it needs to be able to, and even if it gets FDA approval, how that gets disseminated and scaled as a pharmaceutical or a device can be quite long. But what we see with the arts interventions 
when they have um, validity and rigor, they can scale much faster. And so we think that there's something really great about this, 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 the additive value of these kinds of interventions, along with traditional kinds of um, therapies for different, in this case, dis diseases or disorders. And so with that impact thinking model, we've now worked in a number of domains. Um, we've done work with uh, Parkinson's and guitar. We've done work with mental health, youth mental health and decision-making. We've done work with Alzheimer's and singing. We've done work in spaces and places where we develop research projects to really try to understand um, what solutions we might bring to bear. We've been doing a lot of work in architecture and, and physical space design. That's one of the things we've been working on quite a bit. Um, and so we're always working on something that is uh, trying to solve for a some kind of issue that we worked collectively with different departments at Hopkins, but also with other partners around the country and also around the world and been able to build kind of a body of knowledge around what works um, and what what we might need more, more data around. Um, and then we started in 2018, this Neuro Arts Blueprint, which is this leadership. So we do research. We have leadership development, education, outreach, and then just uh, sort of general um, kind of uh, uh, partnership building. And so we are now going to have our first undergraduate course next summer on, on applied neuroaesthetics, which is really exciting. And we've been doing a number of workshops and trainings. Um, NeuroArts Blueprint has now really expanded and there's all kinds of stuff happening there, um, including an event next week on into called intentional spaces, which is super exciting. Um, and we're just continuing to kind of build out the, the research module. So um, it's really an incredibly robust uh, lab um, that kind of works with folks all over the world. You did mention some research with Parkinson's and obviously this is a uh, Parkinson's community here. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, like what are some of the ways that arts and aesthetics can help people with Parkinson's? So there, there's been a lot of work that has been um, growing in this area over the last five or six years, and um, and even a little bit earlier. Um, um, and, and one of them is probably to start with one that I think is probably more well known is the work that's being done with dance. And I'll be curious to hear you know, how many folks um, are, do dance, um, but the Mark Morris Dance Company um, probably it's been close to 15 years now, um, started doing dance, um, dance for, dance for PD is what it's called. And they originally started it in New York where people would come and dance, um, to a series of different rhythm based, um, uh, uh, music and different culture music as well. And that what they found was that early on that people that came and danced just once a week reported better gait and they could see it in the dance studio, uh, but also, better mood regulation, better sleep, and um, and also um, sort of a, a greater sense of, of well-being. And so that was really interesting. And, and that work um, through intuition grew all over the country and also began to grow around the world. But when COVID hit, people um, weren't able to go to the dance studios um, and they decided to pivot and put it online. And what they found was that millions of people started to dance um, with their families. So family members in different parts of the world, or different parts of the country, even the next door neighbor they couldn't, that where you were isolated, would dance with each other. And people started dancing more frequently. So sometimes multiple times a day or multiple times a week. Um, and they started to be able to have these different connections and connectors and also experience different kinds of music. And so that worked fortunately was beginning, was studied over COVID. And what they were able to see is that, and this is super important, is that dose and dosage for an intervention like dance. So dance as a prescription really made a huge difference. And so now they're really analyzing that work to see, is there correlation between how many times somebody dances at what stage in a Parkinson's journey? Um, what are the most effective ways that are really working for people? So that's really exciting, really, really exciting work. But many other art forms um, are being used um, and some of them are coming 
uh, there is this interesting correlation between uh, people that have a um, Parkinsonian um, uh, diagnosis and creativity. And so there looks like there's, a, and this is depending upon, you know, some of the studies that you look at, between 15 and 25% of, of people report feeling more creative and wanting to do more creative work, which I think is super fascinating because, you know, one of the things around creativity is that dopamine as a reward neurotransmitter makes us feel good. And so we want to do more and we, we want to create because there's a sense of, of, um, of immediacy to um, sort of our brains being flooded with you know, dopamine in particular. But it turns out that the, the, the flow happens in the free prefrontal cortex. And flow is that state where you are able to not judge yourself and not critique what you're doing, um, but to be able to turn off that part of the brain and to be able to move into kind of a non-judgmental space where you can just make things and and enjoy that making of them without naming them or thinking you need to be better at them. And that seems to be one of the things that gets activated, the mechanisms that comes online for people that are say, that do have a Parkinson's diagnosis and are also wanting to be more creative. They're not judging what they're making. And, and that's a real gift because it allows you to go into a timeless state where mood increases, where you have this sense of accomplishment. And interestingly, the motor cortex, if you're making things, you're using your hands, you're using your fingers for the most part, you're, you're actually engaging that motor cortex. So other neurotransmitters are coming online like serotonin, probably oxytocin, if you're working with things that are really tactile, um, and, and you're beginning to start to build these other kinds of uh, workarounds. Um, and, and, and you're also continuing to keep um, your, your muscles from um, any kind of uh, atrophy. So you're actually prolonging this use of um, dexterity. So it's an interesting benefit as well. Tell us some of the things that people could maybe do every day. Like you talked about like joining classes or whatnot. What are some things people can do every day? So you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to talk with a number of folks who um, do have a daily practice. And, and I think one of the baselines is that just 15 minutes a day of some kind of a art activity uh, um, lowers cortisol. Um, and that's, you know, obviously a really important um, uh, hormone for feeling good and, and, and not, and, and relieving stress. So at a very base level, thinking about this idea of 15 minutes is a kind of a good benchmark. Um, another piece of research that I want to share before I give you some examples of things you can do. And this was like one of my favorite pieces of research in the book was that these art experiences provide significant benefit, even if you're not proficient at them. So for me, that's really great because I can't carry a tune, not a very good writer, don't knit very well. You know, I'm not, I would not consider myself an artist, but I'm a maker, I'm a maker. And so there's both the maker and the beholder. And both of those sides of the house have very interesting and important benefits for, for, for all of us, but, but particularly when you're starting to think about Parkinson's. And so um, humming, and singing is super important for keeping the respiratory system that we think of it as healing breath, but keeping our respiratory systems really moving and our cardiovascular systems really engaged. So, you know, these art experiences don't just engage the brain, they engage the whole body. So singing in the shower, humming, singing in the car, um, dancing um, anytime. And that doesn't have to be with others. It can also, it can be just enjoying moving to a, to, to, a song, to, a, to song. Doodling is another activity that, you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times if I'm sitting on a Zoom, I'll doodle because doodling is one of those things that you can pay, you pay better attention, you have better recall, and you're actually able to store information in better, in, in more efficient ways. So it's a really interesting kind of phenomena where I think we all were told not to doodle. It turns out that doodling is a, is a really great activity. Um, 
Other things that I think have been seen to be really helpful is in um, activating the different sensory systems. So thinking about how do you activate smell? And smell is a smell and sound are the two sensory systems that go right to your limbic system, go right to your ancient brain. They don't get processed through um, the, the they get they get processed, but they don't get they, the, the their processing is very close to like the olfactory bulb is very close to the the limbic system, and the limbic system is sort of that old part of your brain that goes to the brain stem and then into the central nervous system. You know, into your your um, all the nerves that go through your back and your and all through your body, and so thinking about smells like, you know, if you love citrus or if you love certain flower smells or even the smell of fresh coffee, those are things that really, I consider food medicine. And I think it's been seen to be true. And then being in nature, moving into nature. We also know that just 15 minutes of nature moves our bodies back into homeostasis. And, and that has to do with the fact that we are evolutionarily born in nature. And so we've only been in the human built environment for 0.2% of our 100% we've been on, or so 99.8% of the time we've been in the world, we've been in nature. And so thinking about nature as a, a way to really um, bring you back into a homeostasis to, to, to change mood um, and also to provide clarity is a really great um, thing that we can do. Um, I've met with people who have thought um, and do art activities sometimes at night when they can't sleep and, and they tend to do work, um, more fine motor skill work. Um, working with clay is another medium that doesn't matter if you're left-handed or right-handed. Clay, you and this is unclear why, but our dexterity is equal, both hands, even if you have a dominant hand when you're working with clay. And so one of the nice things about clay is it releases oxytocin. So the love hormone that makes you feel much more um, generous and, and at peace. And it also um, allows you to reshape. There's really no way to work with clay that um, you can't redo easily. So th those are just a couple of very easy entries into thinking about the ways that you might Think about art. We did talk about the PWPs, people with Parkinson's, but I do know that we have some care partners on this. Can art also help care partners at all? That's a that's a great question. Um, so we did a study um, at Hopkins several years ago on uh, Parkinson's and guitar. And these were people who had never played a musical instrument, um, but agreed to take music lessons at Peabody um, and then practice. Um, and it was a, an eight week study and the caregivers would bring um, their family members to um, Peabody for the, for these, uh, for learning. And then they practice at home. And so we did a number of, um, we, excuse me, we did a number of uh, studies looking at what were some of the changes. And for Parkinson's patients, we found that there was increase in cognitive skills, reported better sleep, um, sort of better motor learning, better motor skills, maintaining motor function. But for the caregivers, there was this halo effect. And so when mood and and, and a sense of well being increased, it also increased for the caregivers. And we've seen that over and over again, where there's this halo effect. And I mentioned the Parkinson's um, dance for PD, where family members danced as well. And so there's this real benefit to having those um, experiences together, but also, I think a cognitive load, a, a lowering of cognitive load when you are seeing someone have those kinds of benefits and um an increased mood and 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 cognitive skill. So it's it's super important. And I think we need to study more these kind of uh residual effects of to caregivers when these experiences and also as I mentioned with my sister, sometimes under you can understand more what's happening through the art that's expressed. Um, uh, than anything else. And so I think there's also that piece of it that's happening. Um, so 
obviously in your center, you're, 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 you know, as you mentioned earlier, you're doing all this research. Is there any promising research or anything you'd like to share research wise with us? So, you know, I, this work around um, arts and health is growing dramatically. And uh, the NIH this year has done, um, I think, a really beautiful, over the last five years, um, they've been thinking very deeply about music and sound. And, you know, because I mentioned scent and the olfactory system being so immediate, Sound and sound and music is like that also because uh, you know we're sixty percent water, and vibrations and resonance come through our bodies instantly, and so the shape of of sound changes us pretty dramatically, which I also think is part of the Parkinson's and dance um, phenomena, and that's super super interesting. But we now know that you can play autobiographical music. Um, that will change your mood pretty instantly. Sound travels at three milliseconds. So, you know, if you think about mood shifting, um, music or sound is a really important one. And we also know in some recent studies that this idea around autobiographical music, so the sound songbooks of our lives, things that resonate with us are really, really important. Um, and we're seeing more of that, but there's now a, a playbook or a... Um, toolkit for researchers to use that has shared protocol, shared technologies, and shared outcome measures. So we're starting to really pick up speed, and researchers are now starting to do more work in, in looking at different kinds of sound and um and music modalities and and they're very and they can be very cultural you know we we do know that culture matters so someone just mentioned percussions from carnival um that is a resonance that is autobiographical, right? And, and I'm sure that if someone remembers that from their youth or from their young adulthood, you get that sense of knowing um, where someone who might be drumming in another culture, that is, that's really something that they respond to really instantly and brings back all those memories, um, which change our states of mind. So um, it's, that's really exciting. I, I also think what's, what, what's great is that the research and the technology to, to really non-invasively get inside our brains is changing and it's rapidly developing along with AI. So now we're able to look at big data sets of people using art and understand different kinds of correlates than we have before. So this field of neuroaesthetics where we really can use it as mainstream medicine and public health is becoming a reality. Um, and, and you're probably starting to hear things like arts on prescription where doctors are literally prescribing some of these different types of interventions for isolation and loneliness, for, for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for stroke. Um, and technology is from a dissemination point of view is also really becoming more of a, of a vehicle along with things like virtual reality, where you're able to use virtual reality for things like pain management. I have touched on the cultural and um, social prescribing a little bit, keeping people from being isolated. Is there a role of culture in the creating of these practices? Like maybe you might go one way for some culture or versus another. Is there anything like that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I I think we have sometimes um, uh, forgotten that uh, our experiences make us who we are, and and culture is hugely important in that. And so we see that when when cultural preferences, when narrative medicine is engaged, where we understand what's important to people where they come from, what they know. And that can include um, music, it can include visual arts, it can include writing, expressive writing. Um, people feel more comfortable and they also, it triggers um, the kind of uh, relevance that's really important for healing. So that's why I think of the arts for health and well-being as the closest thing to personalized medicine because it really matters that those pieces are incorporated in, in the things that, that we use, what, whether that's in a cancer center 
or the music that someone might be dancing or listening to if they're looking at neuro, some kind of neurodegenerative illness, it makes a huge difference what people respond to. Before we actually got on this, you and I were talking about visual teaching strategies and you had shared something. I was wondering if we could maybe pivot a little bit and uh, talk about visual teaching strategies a bit. Sure. Um, so this is this is a... I was saying that it would be great to um, do something together. And um, and visual teaching strategies is a, um, an, a, a kind of a methodology that came out of um, the Modern Museum of Art probably 30 years ago. And, and what the person, Phil Yanowin is the person that sort of developed this. And what he saw was that the average amount of time someone looked at a piece of art was about three seconds. Um, and so when you think about observation skills, the ability to see things that um, are in a piece of art or in someone's uh, face or in 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 the world at large, we 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 have not focused on really doing that. But when you build observational skills, you build more empathy, you build more perspective taking. Um, also a sense of meaning making and connection to each other by not judging it, but just seeing it, just witnessing. And so visual teaching strategies is this really simple exercise. And so um, and when, when we do it, you'll say, that's a really simple exercise, but let's give it a try. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an image up and I picked an image this morning um, that I thought was intriguing. And um, maybe in the chat, what I, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you can just put an, your answers in the chat, um, and and it's not to judge, it's not how you feel about it, it's just to answer the question. And then I'm going to ask you a second question, and then I'm going to ask you a third question. The same th the same thing. Put your answers in the chat, and then and then we'll talk about it. So let's just see here. Oh, someone just said here. I've been. I've had several dance classes for about five years and they definitely help me physically, uh, but they also lift my spirits, strengthening my mental health. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, let's see if I can get this up. Okay, let's see here. One moment, please. Okay, let me close that. We all know technology is so wonderful when it works and when we have a little glitch, it's like, come on, computer, do what I'm asking you to do. I know. I mean, I'm gonna have to start again here. Sorry. Oh, I'm now gonna... I see oh, it. Oh, you did. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I saw it. Yep, I just saw it. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. All right, let me do it again. All right. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Now I don't interesting. I I can put this up, but I cannot see the chat. So um let me just confirm that that's true. So share maybe the chat with you the information to, if you would that answer would, yes that would be great okay all right so here's the oh wait yeah let me just make sure I can maybe nope okay okay I think I did it can you see the chat in the middle of that yeah but I can okay. see the chat so you're okay, good I just moved it now can you see it nope I just okay. see the picture okay so all right so the first question is what do you see So I can start by saying, I see a picture of Frida Kahlo. Someone sees eyebrows. I, I personally first focus on the flowers because of the color. Mm -hmm. And Dave agrees with me. He says flowers and color. Mm -hmm. Barbara says two women. Several people say Frida. Frida. I see her lips. An artist. I see a woman with flowers in her hair. Two, two praying, blessed virgin flowers, hat, colorful flowers. A woman adorned with flowers, Madonna in the lower corner. You see her nose, that's interesting. I see a man with flowers in her hair, oh.
I see symbols behind her. Uh, the necklace, wallpaper. Okay, what else do you see? Graffiti, flowers, Warhol-like mock-up. Oh, a woman left to her that's not Frida. Love. Yellow curtains. I see paint running down in the background. Collage. Solemn expression. Black and white photo with added color. Joy, symbols, maybe paper cutouts. I see dark eyes. All right, one more question. Do you see anything else? I see tears, I think, or something on her, what would be her right eye coming down her cheek. Concentrating on something, an animal in the upper left. Sadness and a smile. Heavy makeup, fabric everywhere, two roses, Ah, two roses and the rest are daisies. Interesting. I see a little yellow flower on the right of my screen all by itself. Looks like a bird on the left, a chicken. Overall darkness of this piece, black and white juxtaposed with color. Okay. Hands of a woman, hands of the woman. All right, I'm gonna, anything else, I'm gonna take it down in about five seconds, maybe. Splashes of color. Okay, so what I love about this exercise is it's so simple. Oh, I love sunshine and dark sky. And I don't, for me, I learned, I, I learned a lot from you. I didn't see everything that you saw, but for us to have the time together to see something with each other without judging, judging what the other person is saying, allows us to see so, so much more. And I think there's real uh, uh, grace in, in that and also helps us to be more observant. Um, and so doctors are now using this in training um, new physicians to help really look more carefully and to look more at what you see not look at the symptoms of something, but to really see what are the layers, what are the what's what are the complexities of something. So just for fun, what I'd love for each of you to do is to close your eyes for a minute and reflect on the image. And I'd love for you to just write a word in the chat of how the image made you feel. So what's amazing about these words is the broad spectrum of human experience, right? The broad spectrum of emotion. You know, we experience over 34,000 different emotions. And so when we're looking at this, it's not even about beauty. We talked about beauty being in the eye of the beholder. 
This is about how our perspective and our our perspectives on where we are influence what we see and how we feel about them. And so to make room for all of these enormous emotions, I think is some, you can really begin to start to understand this through something as simple as, as looking at an image. And all of these are incredibly relevant and I think connect us and help us find more meaning in a way that um, just talking couldn't do, couldn't really do. So, so thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that with me. Beautiful. Sometimes we, we talk beforehand and so I get to know this person better. And so then like I make notes and, you know, one thing we had talked about previously was you talked about the aesthetic mindset and kind of changing your mindset to lean into experiences. Can you talk a little bit about that? With Because that fascinated me when you and I were discussing it. So I really want to kind of touch on that with everyone. Sure. So Ivy and I um, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, how, you know, people always say, well, what, what can I do? What, what can I do right now? And we talked a little bit about some things that you can do. But what, what creates the sort of mindset for um, entering into living a more aesthetic life um, and the benefits of, benefits of that are certainly physical, but also mental health, um, thinking about relationships and well-being, um, flourishing. You know, we just don't want to survive. We want to flourish. We want to thrive. It, wherever we are, whatever age or ever, wherever we find ourselves, we don't seek just to cope. Um, and I think let, let, raising that bar is super important for amplifying human potential. So I mean, I started to think about this idea of an aesthetic mindset. What are the tent poles that are really important to live that way, to kind of have a principles? And the first one is curiosity. And curiosity is, is something that I think if you think about how you, if you have grandchildren or children, young children, young children are innately curious. We lose our curiosity when we're told to stop asking why and to and to, to sort of have to conform. But the why question, the curiosity question is how we became the species that we are. We kept looking around the corner and over the hill and we wanted to understand more. So curiosity is really important. This idea of playful exploration, um, you know, we critique ourselves and criticize ourselves and judge ourselves all the time. We don't play. We 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 sort of critique and judge. And, you know, the opposite of play is not work. It's many of the psychologists think the opposite of play is depression, where we aren't really um, allowing ourselves to imagine and pretend and to make believe. And when you put yourself in the state of playful exploration, anything's possible because you're not shutting yourself down. And then the third is being open to these amazing sensorial experiences all around us. So what are you smelling right now? What's the temperature? What, what are you touching that might feel soft or hard? Or what, what are the things that you're experiencing? What How does light impact you? But being, you know, our sensory mechanisms are extraordinary. And because we've become so transactional in so much of our lives, we have forgotten the transcendence of sensorial systems. And then the last one is allowing yourself to be both a maker and a beholder. And again, it doesn't matter what you make and, it, and, and, and what you choose to behold is what is going to change your neurobiology. So do you love opera? Do you love tango? Do you love theater? Do you love movies? You know, do you, what, what are those aesthetic experiences that you want to behold? Is it a conversation, which is, you know, conversation to me is the ultimate improvisational, uh, dialogue because you don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what you're going to say, but we dance, we serve and return. So how do you think about yourself as a maker and a beholder? So those are the four elements that create the conditions for living a more aesthetically mindful life. One of the other things we talked about, and this, this also resonated with me because um, you had such a simple definition of art. And I remember from the movie Mona Lisa Smile, where they were arguing, like, what's art? And someone was like, well, somebody important has to call it art or something. And you just kind of said, art is really, you know, just anything that you can engage in that, you know, kind of, and so 
I'm kind of wondering, and, and I also want to ask people if they want to share, how has the arts impacted your life? You know, this was sort of one way how you communicated with your sister, but, you know, obviously this must impact your life to really have kind of brought you to where you are and be so passionate about it. Well, you know, I, it, it, it's a through line through my entire life. Um, and I think it started because like indigenous cultures, they don't have a word for art because it's how they live. They sing, they dance, they, they, they create rituals and traditions. And without knowing it, my family, my family of origin, that's how we lived. We, we, we arted all the time. We just didn't call it that. Um, and I think, you know, there's the definition that I have for the arts is creative expression. And so there's lots of ways to creatively express ourselves. And, you know, we do it all the time. Um, and so so yeah, when you start to sort of be aware of well, how do you, my, my grandmother used to make trash bags full of what we called granny slippers. And she would bring this trash bag full of slippers and we'd give them out to everybody we knew. And um, it turned out that every pair of slippers took two and a half hours to make. But for her, it was how she shared her love. It's how she shared who she was. And I think we all do that in our in our own way. Um, I'm just being mindful of the question. There's a question in here from Dave. Is Dave, it Dave? yes, because I was going to reach out to him as a support group leader. But I do think that what he's saying, one, because I do think people have more in common than their Parkinson's. But it's like, how do you get this sort of curiosity, for example, in a support group? How do you interject them to have maybe more interest in things? Well, I think the first thing to know about um, any gathering, any group, whether it's your family, uh, you know, partner, work group, support group, is without feeling safe, it's very hard to um, be brave to share your voice. It's very hard. Um, and and so safety is not only the absence of danger, it's the, it's a place where you feel comfortable enough to share yourself. So creating that space is really important. We did a project with seventh, eighth and ninth graders who, um, you know, that's a very difficult age uh, because they can't share with their families because they're growing away. They don't want to share with their teachers because there's consequences and it's not cool to share with your peers. And so we, we did a project where we invited youth to read a book and then um, to create a piece of art to express how they felt about the book. And this was a book about gun violence and decision-making. So big topic. And I, I think that could be a really interesting idea for you is to, to read something that people agree they wanna read and have them make a piece of art and then let the art speak for the person that's created it. And if, if someone wants to share, but to begin to find, to find other ways of knowing other kinds of language where, and without, like we just did with the um, visual teaching strategies, not to criticize or critique it, but to understand what the other person is saying. And you can create those kind of um, containers with your group where people feel like they can share. And, you know, we are only conscious of about 5% of what we are experiencing. So we think, okay, let me see if I can do this. Most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel but we're actually feeling creatures that think. So if you think about that, that's crazy because when you bring a piece of art forward, it's unconscious. It's an unconscious act of creative expression. And then you get to understand it, but then other people get to experience too. So it's a really nice way that you're able to begin to build a different kind of connection with your support group. So, and you can use different art forms. You know, you could even just do kind of a, there's a choir in England called the, the rubbish choir. They, nobody can sing on tune, but they sing together. Other groups start with a poem. Somebody in the group chooses a poem and you start the group by a poem. And then you talk about what did that poem mean to me? So there's lots of ways that you can use art to begin. You could do a 15 minute challenge, seven day challenge where every day somebody makes something and they just share it on WhatsApp. So you can see what, you know, what, and what the prompt, you know, prompt could be something as simple as making sound visible listen to your favorite piece of music and draw while you're doing it. How did you feel before? How you feel after, you know, all kinds of ways, dance for 15 minutes. How'd you feel before? How'd you feel after where you start to use this to really create a different dialogue with yourself and also with the group. Thank you. 
because I do feel like everyone's kind of nodding. Can you give me any few more just examples of artistic expression? Because I really, I see people kind of like when you talked about the clay and now when you're talking about writing a poem, could you just give a few more concrete examples for folks? Well, I think drumming is a really great one. Um, uh, drumming requires, um, there's a lot of people putting a lot of great ideas in the chat too. Baking and cooking can be harsh, but absolutely. I think that food is medicine and baking and cooking and all those amazing, you know, touch recept taste receptors. So absolutely. Gardening is also um, an art form. It's the slowest art form, I like to say. Um, but uh, but using thinking, and I'm, I'm thinking of things that are, um, really easy to access. And I think that's also really important. Um, uh, somebody mentioned the drumming circle. Drumming circles are really amazing because you start to synchronize. You know, uh, we, synchronicity is one of these human traits that is really important for our survival. You know, we march together, we, we move together, we sing together. So being able to use those is also a really important, a really important one. Um, um, I'm thinking haiku. I've seen beautiful haiku um, that's been done. Uh, and, you know, it, haiku is an interesting one because it requires uh, both const constriction of words and also metaphor and symbol. Uh, expressive writing, where you're putting down an idea that is um, maybe one that you, a secret or something that's been bothering you. There's a researcher named James Pennebaker who um, has studied this and just releasing that idea onto paper, even if you don't share it with anybody, lowers cognitive load and also lowers cortisol. So, and it helps you understand what you're feeling. So I think that's another really interesting one. Quilting, beautiful. Watercolor is another really easy and very successful one. I love travel memories personal essays. These are all in the, in the chat there, but it just shows you how at coloring coloring is, you know, the Jungian work around coloring in a mandala and really thinking about what does that feel like di different, di but you can use coloring books. Um, a couple of years ago, coloring books literally saved the publishing industry, these adult coloring books. And again, you don't have to be good at it. I did put in the chat because there are a lot of great websites and everything that people have been adding some great tips and hints. I encourage you to save your chat. If you click on the three dots where it says more, um, you can, a little pop-up will appear and you can save your chat. So I really encourage you to do that so you have all this information. Susan, thank you so much for sharing with us like your, your knowledge and everything today. I so appreciate it. I know everyone else does. We have a tradition here at Parkinson's Movement Disorder Alliance, our wave of gratitude. Thank you so much for being here thank today. You. Thank you so much. It's really an honor, a true honor. And I love seeing all these ideas. I'm saving them too. <laughs> and we can learn, we learn from each other, right? So this is so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.